Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We're going to explore the Adams National Historical Park from the sweet little farm at the foot of Penn's Hill to the gentleman's county estate at Peacefield. Adams National Historical Park is the story of heroes, statesmen, philosophers, and learned women whose ideas and actions helped to transform 13 disparate colonies into one united nation. And we're gonna learn about this wonderful National Historical Park, which I actually passed uh, yesterday, uh, <laughs> passed by it uh, on my way to the uh, Massachusetts Library Association uh, Conference uh, down in Falmouth. Uh, but I, I saw the sign, I almost pulled off the road, but I had to get to my conference. Uh, so this is uh, gonna be led by Supervisory Park Ranger, Jessica Pilkington. So all uh, 200 of us or so who are watching live and the other 300 or so that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jessica for joining us this afternoon. And Jessica, you can take it away. Thanks so much. <laughs> They, thank you very much, Robert. I'm not sure I can listen, li, uh, live up to that hype. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Jessica Pilkington. I am the Supervisory Park Ranger in Interpretation at Adams National Historical Park. And thank you so much for taking your lunch hour to join us as we learn about the Adams family. I just first quick apology if my voice gives in or out. My, my daughter decided I needed to take borrow her cold today of all days. Um, but today we're gonna be talking about Adams National Historical Park. And the wonderful thing about Adams National Historical Park is that we have four generations of Adamses that lived in the many different homes that we have as part of our site. Four different Adamses means four, uh, four generations of Adamses means four generations of stories that we get to talk about every single day about this family. And I don't know about you folks, but when I went to school uh, more years ago than I'd like to admit to, when we talked about the Adam, John Adams and John Quincy Adams within the realm of the US presidency, it was, oh yeah, those were those one-term presidents who didn't achieve much. But hopefully by the time we are done today, we will have a much better understanding of this family and what it meant to be an Adams. I have always been struck by this quote that John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail Adams, on May 12, 1780, and he's describing his family. He wrote, I must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. John is saying, I have to do what's hard now so that my children's lives can be easier and their children's lives can be easier and life will get better as generations go on. And this is a sentiment I hear all the time among my friends, among my family. If I work hard now, my kids won't have to struggle as much. John Adams in the 1780s is saying the same thing that Americans and people across the world say today. Um, so let's see if John was able to achieve this goal for his family. As I mentioned, four generations of Adamses that we talk about as uh, we are going to tour this site. Um, it's, it's generally a little easier to do it chronologically. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do today. Sometimes we'll have to jump back and forth a little bit. But when you're talking the Adams family, Abigail Adams and John Adams are probably the most famous. And when we talk to visitors, there are probably more who say they're here for Abigail, who is an extraordinary woman than they are for John. So why are we talking about them and why has the National Park Service made the effort to preserve their homes? John Adams was born on this site in, on um, October 30th, 1735. His father was also named John Adams. We will call him Deacon John going from this point on um, in order to distinguish between father and son. John was a deacon in the church in the area. He was also a farmer and he wanted for his eldest son, John, a better life. And actually he had intended 
the preach uh, uh, a preachership, the church for his son. But when John was a young boy, he didn't really like going to school, which I'm sure many of us who have kids and grandkids completely understand. John enjoyed things like flying kites and playing outside. Um, and John indicated that he wanted to be a, fa a farmer just like his father. And so there was one day Deacon John pulls young John from school and apparently had John do all of the chores that were on the farm. I am not a farmer. I am sure is very, very difficult. Um, and at the end of the day, Deacon John took his son aside and asked, how was it? And young John basically said, I loved it. Gonna do it again tomorrow. Deacon John said, oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but no, you're going back to school. So his plan backfired massively. And it just kind of turns out that John didn't like his, uh, his teacher's teaching style. And they were able to find new tutors and new teachers for young John so he could go on to Harvard University. And this education at Harvard was basically John's inheritance from his father. The, his other two younger brothers were unable to go to Har Harvard, uh, Harvard College. Um, and John Adams writes, <clears throat> excuse me, in his uh, autobiography about a time that he came home from Harvard College to visit his family. This is a room, it is the, it is the summer kitchen in the John Adams birthplace. And he said he came home to 23 chairs who were in this room. And what was happening is that leaders and people of the town were all meeting in Deacon John's house and they were discussing a man named Lemuel Bryant. And Lemuel Bryant was a sermon and the general theory, according to John, is that his sermons were, quote, too gay and light, if not immoral. And basically, these people were deciding, are they going to kick Lemuel Bryant out? Um, John was witnessing this. And remember, his father sent him to Harvard in order to work for the church. And he said, um, very strong doubts arose in my mind whether I was made for a pulpit such as this. And I began to think of other professions. So this moment is when John recognizes, nope. Preachership is not for me. John Adams, after he graduates college, is a little unsure what he wants to do with his life. His very first job is he is a teacher. He's a teacher out in the Worcester area. Um, about a year into that, he realizes he's probably not a great teacher. And that's when he start, starts his law apprenticeship, ultimately becoming a lawyer. Um, so we have kind of this moment, this is what John pinpoints as a moment where no longer going for the church, he has to try something else. And so President John Adams may not have happened for that meeting in this room when he visited back from Harvard College. So the space is very important then for what happens in this country. After he becomes a lawyer, John grows up and he marries a young woman named Abigail Smith from Weymouth, Massachusetts, which is the town next town over. And they move into this property, which is conveniently 80 feet away from the house that he was born in. So when you visit the park, you can see both the homes at the same time. They are on the same parcel of land. And if we're thinking about the American Revolution, this is the property that we're going to be talking about because during the American Revolution, John isn't home. Of the first 20 years of John and Abigail Adams's marriage, they are apart for 10. I would hate to be apart from my spouse for 10 years. However, I have the convenience of being able to text him whenever I need anything. John and Abigail did not have that convenience, but what this meant was they wrote letters to each other. And we know so much about their lives because they were able to write back and forth. And so many of these letters survive to today. And so that's what we know what they were thinking and what they were feeling and what was going on during the Revolutionary War. Abigail would have been writing letters 
from this house. It is from this house that she takes over all the operations with the farm. It is from this house that she is teaching her children, including a young John Quincy Adams who was born in this house on July 11, 1767. Um, that is until John Quincy Adams joins his father John abroad. And it is from this property that Abigail manages the house next door in which refugees who had to flee Boston following the, uh, following the siege of Boston left to. And Abigail would house them here, which essentially means that she's putting a target on this family's back because they are supporting the revolution. And John had complete faith in her that she would be able to do this. One thing that John and Abigail did, and you can see this on the guided tour, is they would melt down family pewter in order to make bullets in order to send to help and support the war effort. But also a very big thing that happens is on June 17th, 1775, the Battle of Bunker Hill occurs. It's one of the first major battles of the Revolutionary War. Um, and it's during this battle, that Abigail brings her kids, including young John Quincy Adams, up what's now Penn's Hill, which had been about a mile from their farm. And then you could actually look into Boston from, um, from Quincy. Uh, Quincy and both Boston and Quincy have built up since then. So you can't experience this phenomenon anymore. But this here, this cairn is put at the top of Penn's Hill. When John Quincy Adams is 80 years old, you know, this event happens when he's like, what, 10? When Don Quincy Adams is 80 years old, he wrote, I saw with my own eyes those fires and heard Britannia's thunders in the Battle of Bunker's Hill and witnessed the tears of my mother and mingled them with my own. They watched a battle essentially from their home, the first major battle of the American Revolution after the battles of Lexington and Concord, which started the fighting. The day after this battle, Abigail wrote her husband, John, to say the day, perhaps the decisive day has come in which the fate of America depends. And I love that phrase, the fate of America, because now it's not Massachusetts. She's looking at this as this is going to get all the colonies together and finally achieve this goal of a revolution or of a new country. She also, about a year later, March 31st, 1776, writes to John and says, uh, you know, we're hearing you're forming this new government. Be sure to remember the ladies. I think those three words are perhaps what Abigail Adams is most famous for. When you're creating this government, remember the ladies, because if you don't, we will rebel on our own. And John responds to this letter and he's kind of joking about it actually. So there's a, a kind of a tiff back and forth between John and Abigail uh, briefly following this about what this new country is going to look like. And you can read the letters completely for free on the Massachusetts Historical Society website where the original letters, which I pulled here are shown but also they are transcribed. And so they're a little bit easier to read. Um, excuse me. After the Declaration of Independence is signed, John Adams is sent to Europe by, um, by this new Congress. He's sent to Europe. He brings his eldest son, John Quincy Adams, with him. And the idea is to try and get France to help with the Revolutionary War. By the time he gets there, uh, Ben Franklin has already done the job. He comes home uh, briefly. Um, and I mention this because this there's a standing desk that's at the back of this room. This was John Adams's law office in the house that's today known as the John Quincy Adams birthplace. Um, and there's a very big document in the foreground. Between returning from France, John has about six months before he goes back to Europe as an ambassador, as a minister to the Netherlands. But during that time, he writes the Massachusetts Constitution. Uh, there were supposed to be three men working on it together, but we've all worked on group projects, so we know there's always um, one person who does all the work and everyone else shares with the credit. John would later, later write that this document was a sub-subcommittee of one, that person being him. The Massachusetts Constitution is the longest continuously used 
written constitution in the world today. It serves as a blueprint for the United States Constitution. And the, this is the idea where a bicameral government, two houses comes from. But John Adams writes, he begins this document with the phrase, all men are born free and equal. Sound familiar? He mentions this and what happens is in 1781, there is a slave in Massachusetts, a woman by the name of Mum Bet. And in August, 1781, she is able to successfully use that phrase to sue for her freedom. And then a month later, another slave named Quack Walker in Massachusetts is able to do the same. I mentioned that because between those two cases, slavery is effectively abolished in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We are the first state in the country to do so. And by 17, the 1790 census, there are no slaves recorded in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. All done by that fraction of a sentence that John Adams wrote in this room. And the, uh, the standing law desk is still a part of our collections as the park today, in the park today. This uh, this painting was done by an artist named Frankenstein, true story, and it's the, the birthplace homes in the 1860s. It was commissioned by John and Abigail's grandson, but it's one of the few images that gives an idea of what perhaps the farmland would look like. Um, Quincy is a city. And so the farm really doesn't exist anymore. There's only about an acre of land that surrounds the birthplace homes today. So uh, if you go to visit, you won't see the farm, you will see the historic homes, but to give you an idea of what the area looks like. And that road that's in front of the home still exists today and it's called the Old Post Road and that connected Boston to Plymouth, Massachusetts. So in the colonial, excuse me, colonial era, that would have been like the main highway through Massachusetts connecting two of the biggest ports in the, in the town. Still exists today. Different name. In our collections, we do have some blue and white china as well. Um, this china actually comes from China. That's why we call it. But I like to point pinpoint this out um, because the China would be purchased by John Adams while he was in the Netherlands as ambassador, ship it to Abigail Adams, and she was able to sell it. Um, actual China was really hard to get hold of in the, in the early Americas at the time, so she had it in, and this was another way she was able to help support her family during the Revolutionary War. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of what the properties look like today, this, this image is a couple years old, but it's really kind of hard to, to get both of the homes in the, same, in the same image, so I decided to keep it into the PowerPoint. John Adams's birthplace is the brown house on the left. John Quincy Adams's is the more yellow house on the right, yellow to me. And like I said, they're about 80 feet apart from each other, so you get to see two presidential birthplaces at roughly the same time as part of your visit. Um, and they are, we believe, the oldest presidential birthplaces still standing today, original foundations, and they both date to the 1600s. Now, um, John Adams is part of a commission to end the American Revolution. You know, in the United States, we celebrate July 4th, 1776 as Independence Day, but that's not the day that Britain recognized that we were separate. There had to be a formal treaty. It's called the Treaty of Paris, 1783. Um, John Adams is the gentleman who is sitting in his in the front with his hand on the document. And basically, John Adams was saying, I wrote this. But again, we have a committee. Next to John Adams is Benjamin Franklin, who's probably even a more recognizable face. Next to Ben Franklin is his uh, grandson, a man named William Franklin, who was serving as secretary. Behind them in the red, kind of most of his torso missing is Henry Lawrence, the only American imprisoned in the Tower of London during the Revolutionary War. And standing in the back is John Jay, uh, who will be the future first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And this is showing the end, the official end of the American Revolution. Um, 
the British delegate, for various reasons, depending on the person, did not want to be shown sitting and losing to Americans. Um, and so that's why the painting remains unfinished. We have a copy of this as part of our collections that we show as part of the guided tour. But this is a very influential moment because this is when the American Revolution has succeeded. It's not until the pen goes to paper where both, both sides decide they are going to cease fighting that this happens. After this, John Adams serves as our first ambassador to Great Britain. Can you imagine fighting an eight-year war with a country and your first job is to establish diplomatic relations with that country? That is not a job that I think I would be able to do, but that is what this country asked of John Adams. Abigail Adams, their daughter, Nabby, John Quincy Adams, their son, they all meet together. Think about for the first time after a war and they are in England for a couple of years. And it's from here that they purchase a property uh, through an, a relative of Abigail's. They don't move back to those small salt box style homes that they were born into. They move into uh, what was then known as the Vassal Borland House. It was probably one of the best known properties in Braintree. In 1792, this portion of Braintree separates and becomes Quincy, Massachusetts, in case you ever wondered about that. And this is what the property would have looked like around the time that John and Abigail Adams moved in the early 1700s. Uh, sorry, the late 1700s. John Adams would la later write Quote, I christen my home Peacefield to honor the peace in Paris and the end and to um, honor the peace and tranquility I feel while I am there. So, you know, that Paris peace treaty I was just telling you about, that is how this house gets its name. The property is called a peace field. John is telling us this is what I feel accomplished about doing, establishing peace. And remember how young John wanted to be a farmer? Well, when he bought this, it came with 80 acres of farmland that would have been across the street. The idea is he's finally going to retire and be a farmer. Unfortunately for him, six months later, he is elected as the first vice president of the United States, which he does for eight years. He is then president of the United States from 1797 to 1801. And um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, when I was in school, we talked about the Adams presidency. Oh uh, yeah, he was a one-term president. He is, uh, he's there for four years. He's booted out by Thomas Jefferson. Not much happens. And we all know that is never really the case. John Adams in particular is proud of his conduct, what's known as the quasi-war, which is a, uh, an undeclared war fought against the French. Um, there's no way you can ever die, uh, put a war into just a couple of minutes, um, but essentially the United States was not paying some debts, or so the French believed, and so privateers started taking American ships. John was facing pressure from within his own Federalist Party to declare war on France. John believed that the fledgling United States in no way could actually fight against such an established nation, and he refused to do it. So it's not considered an active war. And one of the things John is most proud of during his presidency is that he is able to keep the U.S. out of a real declared fighting war against France. He is a one-term president, however. He was an unpopular president. This episode, I think, highlights how he is a principled individual. Um, he stands up for his beliefs, even though that is not what his party wants of him, which is something he passes down to his kids. During his presidency, he signs the Alien and Sedition Acts, which is hugely unpopular. It is based; These acts are basically perceived as being told, you cannot criticize the government. Um, and did we not just fight a war against the British in order to establish our First Amendment rights? So this, this is very unpopular for President John Quincy Adams. And in 1800, after what's considered one of our most contentious elections in American history, and that's saying a lot because I feel we hear that every four years these days, um, during uh, considered one of the most contentious elections in the U.S. history, he loses the presidency to his former friend, third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. But at that point, he can retire. 
and he retires back to Peacefield. Here is a sketch of Peacefield in 1822. And if you remember from the earlier image, it's about twice the size. In 1800, he and Abigail Adams add what is effectively the right, the right side of the house to the property. And John does retire. He is finally the gentleman farmer that he wants to be. And it's during this time that he resumes his correspondence with Thomas Jefferson. Um, sorry, I just got an alert. I hope you didn't see that on the screen. But he, he resumes his correspondence with former President Thomas Jefferson. And he writes, what you know, whether you or I were right, posterity must judge. And over the next um, <clears throat> 14 years, John and Thomas Jefferson never meet again, but they write letters to each other back and forth like old friends. This desk is known as an escritoire. John purchased while he was in uh, he was in Europe, and we believe this is the desk he would sit and use to order to write this correspondence. He writes to John, he writes to Thomas Jefferson about the passing of his wife. He writes to Thomas Jefferson about the passing of his daughter due to breast cancer even earlier than that. And it is in this room that John has has some of his final moments. Um, John Adams dies on July 4th, 1826, the 50-year anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> and um, his, his final words are, Jefferson survives. Thomas Jefferson had died earlier that day. And I have done the ranger error of spending a lot of my time talking about John, but we have other generations to get to. Um, the house at this point passes to his eldest son, John Quincy Adams. Oh, before I get to that, there is this silk wreath that is part of our collections. You'll see is presented to Mrs. Adams, the lady of the president of the United States by the pupils of the Seminary of Female Education in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, 1826. John Quincy Adams, sorry, John Adams was an oddity in his time that he believed women deserve the same education as men. And he visited this all girls school. So when they pass, uh, when he passed, they made this and gifted it to the family. Mrs. Adams, Lady of the President of the United States is not a phrase that we're familiar with today. We tend not to use it quite as much, but that's because when John Adams died, his son, John Quincy Adams was president at the time. <clears throat> so John was not here at the passing of his father. We have his wife, Louisa Catherine Adams on the left, born in the United Kingdom, and John Quincy Adams on the right. This is them in approximately 1797, roughly about the time of their marriage. John Quincy Adams, <clears throat> excuse me, he's only 11 years old when he goes to France with his father the first time. At the age of 14, he is, he is the secretary to the mission to Russia to try and establish diplomatic ties with Russia during the Revolutionary War. It does not happen at that time, but later he is the first recognized diplomat to Russia. And this is during the time of the War of 1812. Over the course of his life, John Quincy Adams serves as ambassador to the Netherlands, Prussia, Russia, and the United Kingdom. He is considered one of the most traveled Americans of his time. So much so that as part of our collections, we have this, it's, it's basically, um, it is a professional's traveling desk. It is a desk that he could write on, store all of his stuff, and the bottom drawer is a commode. You know you are a professional traveler if you are bringing your own commode with you. In 1814, I like to highlight this. So from 1812 to 1814, the United States is at war again. This is a declared war. And who are we fighting? The United Kingdom. This is a two-year war, which ends in 1814, officially December 24th, with the Treaty of Ghent, written by John Quincy Adams. Um, the, the Treaty of Ghent is essentially a draw. So there's no real winner, there's no real loser, but the perception in the United States is, hey, we, we held a draw with Great Britain, we're going to take it. That's basically it. Um, but I mention this because right after this is signed, Guess what job John Quincy Adams is asked to do? Ambassador to Great Britain. So just like his father, right after we have fought Great Britain, we send in Adams to establish diplomatic ties. It seems to be a running theme here. If we're having trouble with Great Britain, send in Adams in. Um, also during the War of 1812, his, he had left his family back in Russia for safety, but Napoleon, he is 
invading different parts of Europe at the same time, including Russia. The Tsar of Russia gives Louisa Catherine Adams and his youngest son, Charles Francis Adams, this passport to travel safely through Europe so that they can reunite in France during these difficult times. And Louisa Catherine Adams is the woman who is perfectly willing to rent a carriage and drive through worn torn Europe to reunite her family, which is exactly what she does. John Quincy Adams is the sixth president of the United States from 1825 to 1829. As I said at the beginning, he is a one-term president. And at the time, that is how I was taught about him. Uh, why? Well, he, um, in the elections of 1824 and 1828, again, very contentious. Many historians consider these two elections to be the beginning of sort of modern day politicking as we do it today. Um, John Quincy Adams was elected in 1824 when Congress, the House of Representatives, actually had to choose the president because no one actually won. Andrew Jackson had um, more votes but he did not have more than 50% of the votes. And so Congress, the House of Representatives, decides the presidency, um, leaving it to John Quincy Adams. And John Quincy Adams then announces Henry Clay as his next Secretary of State. That is seen as a launch pad for the presidency. Andrew Jacksonian uh, Democrats are against this. And so for the, all four years, he has a very hostile Congress. But to give you an idea of what John Quincy Adams was hoping to achieve during his presidency, I pulled this out of his first annual message to Congress. I will not read the whole thing, it is way too much. But one, there's this one sentence I put in bold in the middle. It is with no feeling of pride as an American that the remark may be made that on this comparatively small terrestrial surface of Europe, there are existing upward of 130 of these lighthouses of the sky, while the whole of the American hemisphere, there is not one. He wants to build an observatory. He wants to use federal funds to build an observatory for the betterment of science. He wants to establish a university with federal funds using the Fed to, cre to create a national university. And at the time, the 1820s, this is seen as far too much of a reach of federal power. And so again, he finds himself unpopular and again, a one-term president. Unlike his father, though, he never retires. He enters the House of Representatives. So he has this very successful diplomatic career, a not very successful presidency, and then a very successful career representing Massachusetts in the House of Representatives following his presidency. As part of our collection, we have these two globes, a celestial globe and a, a, a terrestrial globe. So John Quincy Adams could try and line these up and see what stars you'd be able to see in the sky, depending where you were, uh, where you were on Earth. He's fascinated, clearly his lighthouses of the skies comet, fascinated by um, astronomy. He is the congressman who is able to push through the legislation that creates the Smithsonian Institution, this idea, this love of learning. Um, he is interested in trees. He once wrote that 100 years hence, trees will bear delicious fruit, afford shelter and shade to men. So he would be planting trees all along his property of Peacefield. What I think is coolest is this, is what's known as the Mendy Bible. As a Congressman, John Quincy Adams takes time to defend individuals who had mutinied on board a Spanish slave ship called the Amistad. Um, and this becomes a huge federal case because the ship essentially crashes into Connecticut. And so the decision has to be made. Um, it goes through the court system of, are they legal Spanish property? Or were they illegally captured by the Spanish into slavery? Um, and John Quincy Adams is able to assist the defense. He is not the only defender, but he's able to assist the defense in uh, making the argument that they were born in Africa, which means in, according to the United States law, they are not legally considered slaves anymore and they should win their freedom, which is what happens. Um, these individuals then get together and they purchase this Bible. It is an English language Bible, but they write on the inside, Mr. Adams, we want to make you a present of a beautiful Bible. Will you please, will you please to accept it? And when you look at it or read it, remember your poor and grateful clients. Um, the other image is Mass former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick, the first African-American governor of Massachusetts. He is being sworn in on this Bible. John Quincy Adams dies in 1848, quite literally on Congress floor. Um, and the house and the properties are then inherited by his son, a man named Charles Francis Adams, 
who was that young boy that Louisa Catherine Adams went through war-torn Europe to reunite the family with. And this is Charles Francis's wife, Abigail Brooks Adams. And she brought a lot of money into the family. So the preservation efforts to keep the properties together um, are a, a, lar a large way because of her money. She's able to do that. I found this quote in Charles Francis Adams's diary. I have the misfortune of being the descendant of two great men and must do something to avoid the charge of utter degeneracy. Can you imagine what it must like to be descended from not one, but two U.S. presidents? Two U.S. presidents who are ambassadors and effectively helped to shape the nation that we have today? That's what Charles Francis Adams grew up with. And with John Quincy Adams as a son, that's kind of what's expected of you after. But to show how much of a degenerate Charles Francis Adams was, he also serves as ambassador to Great Britain, like father, like son, like grandson. He is ambassador to Great Britain in the 1860s. He represents Abraham Lincoln's government during the American Civil War. He arrives just as the United States government or a rogue naval officer basically illegally captures um, two envoys from the Confederacy to Great Britain, and he has to try and convince England not to fight against the United States over this. And then after the American Revolution, War, the American Civil War, he is able to get about $15 million worth of reparations in the Alabama claims, which was a ship built in the United Kingdom and then sold to the Confederacy that wreaked damage on U.S. shipping and the U.S. Navy. Um, so clearly this man is a degenerate, but I think it shows a lot of the mind frame of what it is to be an Adams. You know that if you don't rise to the absolute top, are you enough? But Charles Francis Adams, by the way, here is an idea of what that Peace Field House looks like in the 1870s when Charles Francis Adams was living there. He builds the Stone Library, which is a repository for all of his father's books, as well as his and then later generations, at least 12,000 volumes here in this Stone Library. This library is why I applied to work at Adams. It is one of my favorite places on this planet. But he also has the time and opportunity to start publishing the works of his father and his grandparents. So it's under Charles Francis Adams that we start seeing diaries of his dad, as well as letters between John and Abigail Adams being published. He is actually able to retire in a way that his dad and granddad was never able to do. Um, <clears throat> here's Charles Francis Adams and Abigail Brooks Adams in front of the house, um, in front of Peace Field um, towards the later years of their life. Abigail is not particularly looking that happy. And I think of this image when I think of their kids, because Henry Adams, one of their middle sons, and his wife Clover, especially Clover, had kind of a contentious relationship with Abigail Brooks Adams. Not all of us get along with our in-laws totally get it. It happens. Um, Henry Adams, though, he is a historian. He is a scholar. He is a researcher. His wife, Clover, uh, during this time period, you'll see a lot of women take uh, flower nicknames. His wife, Clover, is considered a pioneer in photography, not just women's photography, but photography altogether in the early United States. Henry is a prolific author, both in nonfiction as well as fiction. Two of his uh, best known fiction works are Democracy, an American novel, and Esther, a novel, where he lampoons, um, <clears throat> excuse me, where he lampoons American politics and living in Washington, D.C. at the time. The last two books that I have listed, A History of the United States during the administrations of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, he, he largely wrote in that stone library, and The Education of Henry Adams. That was published in 1918, and it wins the Pulitzer Prize in 1919, which is after his death. He doesn't, it's not published during his lifetime, it's published after the fact. Interestingly, considering the education, the uh, education of Henry Adams is an autobiography, his wife is not mentioned. Um, and a part of that is because Clover Adams takes her own life. She dies by suicide about six weeks after the death of her father. She was very, very close with her father. And in order to try and deal with his grief, Henry Adams commissions from um, Augustus St. Gaudens which is uh, his house is a national park up in New Hampshire. He, uh, he commissions this 
really unnamed work. And this is at Clover's grave in Rock Creek Cemetery in Washington, DC. It's sometimes known as the mystery of the hereafter. It is sometimes known as misery or grief, but it is supposed to be um, an individual. We're not sure if it's a, a, a man or a woman, but an individual just cloaked in grief. And Henry would sit and he would watch people go by this, um, by the uh, the monument and try and figure out what is Henry, uh, what are people thinking um, because it is so ambiguous. But he mentions this in his education of Henry Adams, but doesn't really mention Clover herself, which may have been a way for him to process his grief after the sudden and unexpected passing of his of his wife. And he has a room that still survives at Peacefield today, um, which I think brings up an interesting point. How do we have so many of these objects? It's because the family held on to it. And this man, Peter Brooks Adams, we know him as Brooks, was the, who's uh, the last living resident of Old House at Peacefield, starts setting up the property as a museum. He is the one who is collecting these objects. Not only that, which I think is very, very cool. His personal secretary is a woman named Wilhelmina Harris. She records a lot of what he says. She is heavily involved in all of our furnishings reports. Um, and she is the first superintendent of Adams National Historical Park when we become a national park in the 1940s. We have a direct connection from the family to becoming a national park, which is so, so cool. And it is through Brooks Adams, who was also a historian and a Harvard professor in his own right. This is generally an idea of what Peacefield looked like during his residency there. He passes away in 1927, at which point the house is gift, uh, the um, Adams Memorial Society is created. And then in 1946, the banner year, Peacefield is gifted to the National Park Service so that this house is given to the American people. The idea is that we can use it to promote, um, <clears throat> to promote, um, civic duty and engagement in all the people who come through. Peacefield today is beautiful. And John Adams was right on the mark when he named it Peacefield, because even though a train goes by, even though we're on a major road, if you stand in this beautiful formal garden, you are in another world. It is quiet. It is Peacefield. I can understand how in the busy world that we live in today, John Adams came here. Um, we have a trolley that connects all the historic homes we're working on this right now for the 2023 season. Um, so most visitors, once we reopen, um, we can go to our visitor center. The idea is we'll be able to hop on a trolley and visit all the homes because three homes in different locations in the city driving through downtown can be a little bit difficult. Um, so I want to go back to that original quote. I must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. Did the family pull it off? Were John Adams's wishes honored? From presidents in politics to Pulitzer Prize winner, did we were we able to go off from war to art? I just think it's a fascinating connection. Coming ahead, we have two huge celebrations that are going to be happening back to back. There's America 250, which is going to be the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. You can't have that without talking about John and Abigail Adams, as well as Quincy turning 400 the year before. In 2025, Quincy will be turning 400 years old, one of the oldest places in, in, uh, that have been settled in the new world in the United States that still survives. So that is definitely keep an eye out because there are going to be celebrations and commemorations throughout Quincy and the entire United States as we celebrate these two, these two items at the same time. If you want any more information, here is how you reach out to the park. Our website, nps.gov slash Adams. And then we have a Facebook and social media, as well as the phone number for our visitor center where a ranger will gladly answer any questions that you have. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak for me. I know I went over a little long, Robert, please forgive me. No, Jessica, no, no forgiveness needed. You did a wonderful job. So uh, Jessica, would you like to stop sharing your screen and we'll get, we'll get, um, 
because right now we're just seeing a black screen. There we go. There we go. All right, so let me pop Thank back you. up to, no, no problems. I'm gonna spotlight your video. So I am not seen as much. Okay, so folks, if you have questions or comments for Jessica, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, let's see, an, anon an anonymous attendee asks, what are the four homes included in the park? That is a fantastic question. Uh, I may have misspoke as three homes in the Stone Library. So we have, well, there's our visitor center. As for the historic homes, we have the birthplace of John Adams. We have the birthplace of John Quincy Adams, which are on the same property. We have Old House at Peacefield, as well as the Stone Library, which houses the family collection. So when you visit the park, if you take the guided tour, you get to see all of those properties. Speaking of that library, uh, Linda says, uh, I would love to hear more about your affection for and use of the beloved library, if time permits. So my affection for the library is personal. And that's what I think is great about the National Park Service is that you get a personal connection to the site that you go. I grew up from a line of readers. I always saw my mom reading. I always saw my grandma reading. So I love reading. And so when I saw that there was a president who lived right around the corner from where I grew up, who loved books, that is very much, that very much spoke to me. Um, the library is generally not used today. While a lot of the volumes, um, you can be found elsewhere. Um, but if you're interested more in that, you can reach out to us. The generally speaking though, um, you know, the books are just to kind of look at and use as a space to contemplate. Uh, Patricia asks, when do tours open? Uh, that is a very, very good question. We are working on hiring all the staff as well as getting the trolleys running. Um, you know, after COVID, purchasing new vehicles and then not being able to use them can cause, a, you know, a little bit of a hiccup. But we are anticipating end of May, early June. Keep an eye out on recreation.gov because guided tour tickets will be posted there. Um, absolutely order, to, uh, get the tickets in advance if you know there's only a date or time that you absolutely can go to. Any tickets that are not sold in advance online will sell del day of at our visitor center. Uh, so follow up question from Scott, is there an admission fee to visit? Sure, so it is $15 per person to visit. Children under the age of 16 are free. If you have a National Park Service pass in America, the beautiful pass, like an annual pass, senior pass or military pass, then you get in for free. And you can also get any of those passes at our visitor center as well. We are one of the few sites that's able to do it all year round in Massachusetts. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, was John Adams' father born in Massachusetts? Also, what religion was the family? <laughs> so yes, John Adams' father was born in Massachusetts. The Adams family came over to what's now Quincy shortly after Qu what's now Quincy, then Braintree was founded around 1625. Um, probably the best modern connection for religion for Deacon John and the family is probably Congregationalist. Um, they would have been very, very religious at the time. Um, it's, it's just kind of how, the, especially the New England area was, but their form of congregationalism is not quite what is existing in practice today. Things change and evolve over time. Um, so yeah, probably we, we had a ranger for many years who was very interested in the Adams family and religion. And he said that congregational is probably the closest we're gonna get to today. Uh, Catherine asks, who lived in John's birthplace when John and Abigail moved next door? That is a fantastic question. And thank you for asking that because I, I did want to address this and Ranger problem talking too much. Um, there was a former slave who was owned by Abigail Adams's father by the name of Phoebe. She was living in the properties while they were gone away and Abigail trusted her to run a lot of the farmland. Um, and then it continued to be rented out and a couple other people moved in and out, but Phoebe was really like the main resident who was running the show. Is the home of Abigail Adams a historic site? It is a historic site and it is owned and operated by a nonprofit organization in Weymouth, Massachusetts. So it's not a part of our park, but we work together frequently with them all the time. So um, I don't believe they're announced their tour schedule yet, but if you check their website, you can find all that information. Um, Wendy asks, how did the first generation react to having a British born daughter-in-law? <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. Think about it. We just fought a war against Great Britain. What does their oldest son do? He immediately marries a British woman. Uh, reportedly, Abigail was not too particularly pleased at this development. John Quincy was raised at a young age to become a leader of this nation. There are letters from Abigail that John that effectively say, if you don't become a leader of this country, you failed us. Um, a little more 18th century language. Um, so yeah, Abigail in particular was not pleased. John seems quite smitten with Louisa Catherine right away. She was a very friendly, very personable person. Um, Abigail was kind of afraid that she would have been raised as this high class English woman that couldn't quite handle the rigors of New England living. And then Louisa Catherine Adams has her child and takes her on a 40 day journey through Europe from St. Petersburg, Russia to France to reunite the family. So why actually why I show that uh, that passport um, and that seems to kind of smooth things over a little bit. So Jessica, pop quiz, spelling uh -oh. test. Uh, we have three people asking the spelling of, and hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, uh, mu music. Uh, M-U-S-I-C-K? Yes. Is, did you reference that? Is that, is that the... Uh... That is how John wrote it in his letter, but it's like okay. music, performing, playing instruments. Ah, gotcha. But okay. he wrote it phonetically. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, let's see here. Uh, a lot of anonymous attendee uh, questions here. Uh, Scott asks, did Abigail ever express any upset over John not being with the family at home? Yes. Yeah. Um, she seems to understand the why, but there is also, you know, I would more say the upset is the lack of communication, which partially was brought on by a war. She seemed to understand and appreciate the why of the separation, that he is helping to create this country and establish what it is. But the lack of communication was very, very hard for her. And that might be more accurate to say. You'll see her letter say, it's been quite a while since I've heard from you. You know, I wrote to you a month ago and I still haven't heard anything. So maybe her issue was more being kept out of the loop than the fact that he was away. Um, uh, Barbara asks, uh, Jessica, we're going to be in, I don't mean to cut you off, but we're nope. going to, we're going to, we're going to do, um, rapid fire questions and okay. answers here. We're, we're in a lightning round. Okay. Uh, Bar Barbara asks, how many and what languages did John and John Quincy speak? Oh gosh. So John spoke English, struggled to learn some French reportedly depends on where you look john quincy adams had learned french by the time he had reached europe as an 11 year old john quincy adams really picked up languages quickly we are pretty sure well we know he spoke french that's why at the age of 14 he went to russia because diplomats use french to speak with each other so he could translate for the american delegates but pretty sure he could also speak german probably was learning russian um, as well um, at the time of his death, he reportedly was trying to teach himself Greek. Um, mm -hmm. In order to go to Harvard, you would have had to have passable knowledge of Greek and Latin. Um, so he would have probably been able to some degree speak to those two. All right. I'm going to combine some questions. And sorry if you touched on this already. Uh, William asks, is the library open to visitors? Mm -hmm. And Eva Jane asks, is there an online catalog of the books that are contained in the library? Um, the library is open to visitors as part of the guided tour of the other sites of the home. That's how you can visit them. And if you visit our website, nps.gov slash Adam, um, most library stuff is available on that. All right. So, Jessica, we've successfully <laughs> answered most of the questions. Folks, if your question was not answered, uh, I will provide Jessica's email uh, in the email, I'm sorry, I will provide Jessica's email address in the email that I send you all uh, later today. Also in that email will be a recording and uh, information, a feedback survey and information about some other upcoming programs, including our virtual visit with the Springfield Armory National Historic Site uh, next Wednesday, May 17th at noon. Jessica, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today um, and enjoy learning more about the, this really, really cool family. Great. Well, thank you. You know what? This is my new favorite Adams family. How about that? Okay. You've convinced me because there was another one I liked, but now I like this one more. So thank you all so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks Have again, Jessica. One. Thank Feel you. Feel better. Yep. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.